Right? In talking about international war, we have to recognize the, the limitations of coercive instruments. Um, so, limits of coercion. Um, the first limit of coercion is that it's ineffective against transnational threats. Right? Um, obviously, right, coercive instruments are not going to be effective against transnational threats because it's harder to localize the threat. Right? It's very, very difficult to localize transnational threats. Um, so, using coercive instruments, even if you could theoretically localize them, um, might differ um, nationally. Right? It might differ regionally. It might differ. Um, so transnational threats are, are invariably very, very difficult to localize, right? So they're difficult to localize. By definition, transnational threat. Right? So that's the first thing. So the limits of coercion, the first thing is it's difficult to localize transnational threats. Um, better equipped against state-oriented threats, right? Tra um, lim one of the limits of coercion is that um, there's a better attempt to, uh, um, for whoever the targeted group is to equip themselves against state-oriented threats, right? So, for example, Libya, we'll go to that as an example now. Um, I think Gaddafi said two, two days ago, or maybe a day ago, yesterday, I think it might have been, he said, this is going to be a long war. He's, he's prepared. Right? He, he's prepared for, I, I doubt it, and I hope it's not, I really hope it's not, but if it is the case that it is in fact a long war, and I can't see it being a long war, but if it is the case that it is a long war, then obviously, um, specifically, the United States government is further entrenched in that war, right? because to engage is easy, to disengage is, 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 is far more complicated. I'm, I'm putting confidence in our, our leaders that they have um, strategies and that in fact will be done in... Uh, in a relatively short period of time. Um, another threat is, or another uh, limitation, is that it's difficult to identify non-state actors. I mean, that's obvious, right? If we're talking about um, limitations of coercion, if I am attempting to coerce the state, right, then, I, then it's easy to coerce the state, right? I mean, best coercion of the state is <laughs> just bribing, right? Just, you know, you, you, you're paying, and there's actually really, really good research, really good research. Written, written on buying peace, right? And I'm all for buying peace as a conflict resolutionist, as a peacekeeper, as a peace activist. Um, you can let the moral arguments aside. You know, if, if I can pay, if a government, government A, can pay uh, government B bribe money to keep peace within their state and not escalate um, intrastate war into interstate war, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. There's pros, there's cons. I'm not gonna get into it all right now, but just generally speaking, you know, that's easier to do, right? You can coerce, obviously money is a form of, bribery is a form of coercion. It's more difficult to, um, it's more difficult, if not impossible, to have coercive instruments, financial coercive instruments that are non-state directed, right? Um, obviously the groups are going to be more disparate, right? So this person might accept the bribe, this person might not, this person might, this person might not. It's, it's very, very difficult. Um, when the problem rests outside of the state, right? For, so for non-state actors, a course of instruments are very, very difficult to implement. Um, obviously, there's an, in, as, as you see here, there's an obvious disorganization among non-state actors, right? It's not like the state that is, that is regimented by the bureaucracy, right? Non-state actors function basically autonomously or independently. Right? Non-state actors are autonomous actors, right? State actors are not autonomous actors. There's a bureaucracy, there's a hierarchy. It's easier to control the actions of a state, right, through coercive means, if those coercive means are financial, than it is to, um, to use and implement coercive instruments against non-state actors because of the nature of non-state actors, right? They're autonomous, independently, or, um, very, very loosely organized groups of individuals that can wreak havoc Right, so it's very, 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 very uh, difficult. Uh, obviously, manipulation of public opinion, right? Um, limits of coercion is that, well, I mean, if it gets out that government A is bribing officials of government B, that can have uh, huge media ramifications, right? 
why is the government bribing? Why is the money being used for this? The truth is that people really don't need to know. It's like the scene in Men in Black. If people knew exactly how many times the, the nation was threatened each day, you know, like the person couldn't, the person couldn't live, right? Because it's continually threatened, and there are things that need to be done on a larger scale that people just wouldn't be able to understand in order to maintain and preserve national security, right? Um, so it's a, it's a dirty business. It's, a, it's, it's definitely a dirty, dirty business. Okay, so the next point pertains to um, the new face of terrorism, right? The new face of terrorism. Um, obviously, the new face of terrorism, one, and I'm not going to write these down because you have it here. The first thing is that it lacks hierarchical organization, right? There might be um, disparate cells spread throughout um, various nations, and those cells are loosely, tacitly organized by maybe cell leaders, and really only the cell leader has information to the broader nexus, but even then, it's really only the architects that have total understanding, so that even cell leaders are operating, in a sense, in the dark. So the coordination of action takes place um, by one person, maybe, or two people, and everybody else is sort of loosely organized. That's hard to fight, right? That's hard to fight. Maintaining clear political goals, right? Um, terrorist organizations, terrorist cells, terrorism in the 21st century, um, their activity is political activity, right? And what you have is non-state actors, right? Non-state actors, as we, as we saw before, autonomously or independently non-state disorganized actors acting against the state, right? So lots and lots of interstate conflict, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of interstate conflict, which obviously spill over or carry into interstate conflict, right? Again, very, very difficult. Um, the influence over public opinion, um, as we saw before in uh, Nakos' uh, 1994 book, right? Media is used to influence public opinion. And then lastly, um, terrorism with a human face. I got this idea from, uh, from Zizek. He talks about capitalism with a human face in his RSA, in his RSA uh, speech, which I thought was super cool. And it, there is a sense in which Terrorism with a human face now is like, well, don't, you know, it's the attempt to doctor terrorism as being actually justifiable. Look what the West is doing. Look what these people do, are doing. Look what the, these ethnic groups are doing to us, right? So that sympathy, right, you have the terrorist organization, right? And what the organization does is the organization attacks, you know, attacks state A, if you will, right? Attacks state A. But in attacking, right, it justifies this attack so that the attack is itself bolstered by, supported by, um, cries for sympathy. Right, so that the attack is justified, right, so this is a form of justification right here, right? The attack on state A by the terrorist organization is bolstered, is justified by cries for sympathy. The cries for sympathy is itself directed towards not the state, but to um, sympathizers. Right? And what ends up happening is sympathizers are made to appeal to the, the implicit, not the explicit, the implicit threat or attack on the group, right? This is an explicit, right? So the terrorist group's attack on state A is an explicit form of attack, but they justify this explicit form of attack by saying structural violence, so on and so on, implicit attacks on the group, right? Quote unquote terror, they would say. Implicit attacks, structural violence being included on the group is what justifies, right? Sympathizers. So you say, the sympathizers, well, well, look, of course, of course, they attack the state because here's what the state's doing to them, right? And so on and so on and so on, right? So that what ends up happening is they're able to garner within this group of sympathizers a relationship, right? Sim they appeal to sympathizers, crying for sympathy, right? They appeal to sympathizers and in turn hope that sympathizers join their terrorist group which results in the expansion of the terrorist organization, right? So what ends up happening is 
um, they explicitly attack as a consequence of what they say is an implicit attack or structural violence attack on the culture, the livelihood, the ideology, whatever, of the group, and use that to justify to sympathizers their involvement in the organization, right? So what they're saying, and this is what, this is what I mean by terrorism with, with, a, um, with a human face, is that it's saying, listen, we're terrorists, but we're really not bad people, right? What ends up happening is that we are being attacked. We are the victims. Obviously, this is victimhood here. Um, we are the victims of the state's attack, and the only way that we can sort of rage against the machine, though we don't want to, is to explicitly attack the state. Don't you see that we are the victims? You should see that we are the victims. These people say, yeah, I recognize that you are the victim, right? So there's a recognition here of victimhood. There's a recognition of victimhood. And once sympathizers recognize be it true or not, the victimhood of the group, they'll join the group, right? So that's how, I mean, that's how it works, right? And what ends up happening is that being labeled a terrorist isn't um, really a bad thing anymore because what I end up saying is, no, being labeled a terrorist, right? You have to think, you have to think like a terrorist, right? Being labeled a terrorist is actually a badge of honor because what I'm saying is I'm justified in my explicit attack of the state. Why am I justified in my explicit attack of the state? Because what they don't want you to know is that they have constructed this structural violence to suppress and oppress my people and me and my beliefs, blah, 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 blah. And if you don't join us, then they're going to attack your beliefs and so on and so forth. Sympathizers will recognize, will recognize the victimhood, the alleged victimhood of the terrorist organization and then join the, the organization. And, and thus it's not like this, we really just want to kill people. It's more terrorism with as Zizek would say, terrorism with a human face, right? So uh, I think that's, I think that's uh, extremely important uh, to recognize. Okay? Um, two more points and then we're finished. Challenges to the concept of terrorism, right? Challenges to the concept. Um, there is an argument, uh, this argument is proposed uh, by um, Goki, um, terrorism is in a con as a concept is too general, right? And we talked about this before. That talking about terrorism is, is just too vague, right? It's too vague to be objective. Oh, B. And I talked about some of the uh, the complications with that. There's a certain amount of merit to that argument. There's a certain amount of problem with that argument. But you know, I talked about that earlier. Um, second point: evoking the term terrorism serves as a refusal to engage in political discourse. So as soon as you say someone's a terrorist, now I don't need to use reason anymore. Right? As soon as I say someone's a terrorism, uh, as soon as I say someone's a terrorist, then now they've lost their humanity, as I said before. Right? So evoking terrorism, it's just a refusal for debate. Uh, that argument, um, Joseba, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, um, 1996, Terror and Taboo, The Follies, Fables, and Faces of Terrorism. Right? So that's an argument. So that um, refusal to debate. And then number three, um, terrorism is a distraction from real international disorder and imbalances. So that basically all terrorism is is a distraction. Right? So the third is that uh, it's really a distraction from real conflict. Terrorism, this, this talk of terrorism is actually a uh, distraction from real conflict. Um, and that was proposed in anti-diplomacy, spies, terror, speed, and war. Right? So that when we're talking about terrorism, we're not talking about real international problems, real international threats, because we're wasting our time, we're distracted by this discourse on terrorism. And then the effects of terrorism um, on international conflict resolution is that it destabilizes international cooperation, which we've seen. It destabilizes interstate security, which we've seen. Interstate and intrastate security, both inter and intrastate security, are destabilized. Um, um, it has the potential to expand regional conflict, and that spills over into interstate conflict, which we said. And then finally, it makes it difficult to distinguish between state and non-state actors, which uh, I've discussed as well. 
So with that being said, that concludes uh, section 1.1 of the analysis. That also concludes um, Martha Crenshaw's chapter in, um, in uh, Midlarsky's Handbook for War Studies 2. Um, I hope that that was informative. Uh, stay tuned for the next section of international war and terrorism. With that being said, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Thank you, and have a good day.